Good morning and welcome to the first of a series of four talks on Toast event with me, Makita Oliver. This event has been curated in partnership with cultural communications agency, Margaret and Magic Breakfast Charity. I'm pleased to say that all the donations from tickets for today's event will be going directly to Magic Breakfast, who are a wonderful charity that provide healthy school breakfast to around 167,000 school children who would otherwise be too hungry to learn. Magic Breakfast are amazing. So each talk will explore a different theme designed to keep you culturally refreshed and inspired. Today's theme looks at creative activism and more specifically, how to use creativity to get your voice heard. So we'll be unpicking what role creativity plays in creating awareness for a cause or belief and how if used well, it can make a difference in the world. To help me answer this question, I'm joined today by Zing Teng, the executive editor of Vice Magazine and artist Andy Leake, better known as Notes to Strangers. Hello guys, are you with me? Hello. Are you on there you are, hello. Yeah, Hello. Hello, Andy. Hello, Zing. I do have introductions for you both that I'm going to do now. Zing, we'll start with you. Zing's a journalist with over 10 years of experience across print, online and broadcast media as an editor, writer and presenter. She is currently Vice's UK executive editor, where she specialises in arts, culture, identity and current affairs. As a presenter, Zing has been at the helm of Vice World News short form video series, Empires of Dirt, as well as Vice's award-winning sex and dating podcast, My First Time. She's also presented the BBC podcast, United Zingdom, and in 2018, released a four book series called Forgotten Women, which explores the untold stories of inspiring women who have been marginalized from history. Zing, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited. Absolutely. And we also have Andy. Hello, Andy. Hello. Andy is best known for his Notes to Strangers project, which he launched in 2015 after suffering mental health issues and having to take some time out from his career in advertising. He decided that he wanted to give people walking down the street something positive to look at in their daily lives. In 2020, he expanded this to launch a project called Notes to NHS Staff, and has since then sent over 1,300 posters to hospitals across the country for workers to post in break rooms, kitchens, corridors, and offices. Guys, thank you so much. Let's do this today. Should we go straight into our, straight into it? Let's do, Let's do it straight in. Let's go talk about creativity. I actually did want to talk uh, to both of you about how you first discovered your creative voice and, and whether there was something that made you feel particularly inspired to use it. Andy, I know that you were mo motivated by having mental health issues, um, but Zing, what for you was sort of moment where you found that you your creative voice was found even? Um, I think just through reading and books. So I was really like loner kind of child some might say a loser um and I just read a lot and I started writing all these stories like nonsense stories like literally we're talking like four-year-old stories that make no sense about old ladies who live in trees that kind of thing uh, <laughs> I'm very into fern gully um and that was kind of how I realized that I had a kind of creative voice and wanted to express it I guess and that was kind of what led me into writing and then journalism did you feel that you were encouraged to use that creative voice that you were discovering at the time. Yeah, definitely. My mum was a huge, huge encouragement. So um, she would literally just take me whenever I wanted to a library, to a bookshop, and would just like check out as many books as I wanted. So I would go every single week to a local library, check out tons of books, um, read them all, and then check back in like a week later. And it was basically because my mum just really wanted to encourage me. And that's why I'm a really big supporter and advocate for libraries now, because I really do think that opens up so many worlds to kids. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. I think it's disgusting what's happened to libraries in this country. Um, Andy, I wanted to ask you, because I'm, I'm the same as Zing, mine is my mother. My mum encouraged me. She pushed my creative voice um, and mind. Did you have someone in particular that helped you bring your creativity out? Um, I'm not sure if I would say there was a specific person. Um, I mean, my parents are always very uh, encouraging with with art and always buying me art materials whenever I, I um, whenever I needed it. Um, but for me, I think that 
being an artist specifically, you kind of had to have something a little bit wrong in your brain. I feel like a few wires that have been disconnected and then reconnected in some sort of like unique way that means that you see the world a little bit differently. And actually, sadly, often it happens through a traumatic experience. I mean, personally was um, losing my mom to cancer at the age of 24. And I turned to art as a way to get through that pain. I turned to it as a sort of therapy for myself. So you could point to that as a specific moment where I kind of discovered my voice. I don't think it was ever really a conscious decision. It's just kind of what I'd always done. Um, and while sort of Notes to Strangers is the project that uh, took off for me in the biggest way, there were like many, many projects before that that um, were an expression of my creative voice of sorts uh, that perhaps didn't take off in that way. So it was always it was always something that I've been doing. But then uh, talking about that traumatic experience of losing my mom, then there was another one of having this mental health problem that sparked the idea for Notes to Strangers. And perhaps that clarified it. Um, and the, the whole sort of episode gave me the experience, the pain, and more importantly, the freedom to express myself. Yeah. My, my advertising career had led to ultimately to a failure. Um, and with that failure, I kind of had this feeling of, oh, well, I've just spent eight years doing that and it didn't work out. What have I got to lose? And that's a really powerful, powerful feeling when, when it comes to creativity. Yeah, that, that sort of the courage that comes from uh, just blind faith in what you're doing. Like, what have I got to lose? Let's just dive in. I think that's exactly yeah to... the um, the fearlessness that comes from that. Yes, absolutely. So I I remember a time when my creativity was about uh, my mind and nothing to do with having to put it on a platform to be either judged or encouraged by other people. You know, I was in the old days of just telly, but with social media, it does play such a pivotal role in putting an idea that you have and making it sort of feel alive. It is, it is where things go. Do you think that it, it compromises creativity, social media, or it can only enhance it? Zing, I wanted to ask that to you first. I think it's a kind of a double edged sword because it's really easy to get, I guess, lost in the sauce and chase likes and traffic and like easy feedback, really, um, because it's just so immediate. And like the you know dopamine hit of getting something that has loads of likes is almost sometimes like more intoxicating than actually putting the product out um, yeah. and engaging with it in a deep way. Like we've all felt that um, like even I've put stuff out and I know like in my heart, it's like amazing but then when it doesn't get the same amount of likes as I don't know like a picture of someone on holiday I'm like oh god what's wrong with it but I just mm -hmm. think that it's important just to keep that perspective and to like have that kind of integrity in yourself to know when you can say point at a project you've done and say this is good objectively good I'm judging it on my own kind of you know targets and goals and you know my like love of the project and I don't need external gratification to tell me it's good like I already know that and everything on top of that is just a plus like that's oh, that, easier than done. Yeah, that sounds great <laughs> I'd like to be it's that. like a constant war with myself with the voice in my head <laughs> got you um Andy um No Such Strangers has been um such a huge success and also you know you you do use Instagram for the things that you want to do how did you decide which sort of social platforms would work for the creative things that you wanted to do because there's so many now well, I mean, personally, I don't think that the platform is all that important, like the platform choice. I think that when I was when I was like in the early days of No to Strangers, I never really thought about, oh, will this go on Instagram? Will it go on Twitter? Will it go here? I just focused mainly on the the thing itself, the artwork itself. And then when when you create that artwork and you put all that the, the love and the, the the hope and the optimism into into the, the work itself. It kind of finds its own way. It, um, it finds its own place to live, and um, people take it and 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 will will share it, whatever's yeah. easiest. And I think that um, it was a case of that with with notes that I just had this idea of sharing um, positive words that might make a difference to people's days, and then it all happened organically as a result of that. I mean, there's so many times that I've seen people launch something creative online, and the um, the Insta page or the um, the promoting of it is there's way more going into that than there is the actual artwork or the content itself, and right. kind of the the tail wagging the dog. But um, there's no point in having a really slick 
platform or a really uh, really well curated uh, stream of content if the content itself is no good. Yeah, it can't just all be about bloody Instagram, can it? So do you think that the, having social media and, and, and let's say having a following on social media, do you think that that then leads to an expectation for people putting out creative content to take a stance on social or political issues. I mean, of course, last year we all felt inclined and part uh, to be part of the many, the myriad of political issues that came to the fuel of our lives. But do you think that you, it's a responsibility when you have a following on a social platform? Zing, I'd like to ask you that, babe. It's an interesting question because I think the danger is that people and also brands can just jump straight in, both feet first, without a deeper engagement or understanding of you know, what standing for that political cause can be. So for instance, you know, I remember when, you know, the wing, which is like the, an all women membership club lodged this huge fanfare. And, you know, it was like really kind of staked its, staked its cause on, you know, being the space for women that was safe for women, uh, but that was political and feminist. And then I think around late last year, the year before last, loads of female employees came out and said, actually, that wasn't the case at all. And it was actually a very bad working environment for some of them. Um, so I think it's important before you start rushing into like um, supporting causes to actually think about what exactly you're putting your name behind and whether you have the consistency yeah. and I guess the range to back yourself up because there are going to be people who look at you and maybe thinking, I've not heard this person talk about these issues before. Like, is it just bandwagoning? And I think it's really important, not just for you know other people's perception of you, but also for your understanding of the issue, because you don't want to like throw your name behind something without an understanding of what is you're standing for, um, because in the end, you're just going to end up with, I guess, like mud on your face, really. Absolutely. And also there's that thing of like, even when you do feel um, like you, you are behind a sort of movement, it can be like just the way you put your feelings out on it, something like social media kind of takes away the authenticity of your feelings or something. I know for, it, for, for me with Black Lives Matter, there were so many things I was feeling and going through and things I wanted to say, but Instagram just did not feel like the right place quite a lot of the time, you know, because it was such old trauma and things. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, we all have to remember the importance of these things because when you have an idea and you put it up here, it can thrive in these, uh, in these places. Um, particularly in terms of drawing attention to a cause or a belief that you both have worked on. Can you remember a time that you have really used social media and it's really propelled something that you're doing creatively? Andy, can you, I mean, of course, no, from strangers, but you know, would you continue to use social media in that way for the things you want to do in the future? Because it has, it has worked so beautifully with the things you've done so far. Um, I think that, I think that it's, it's like, like Zing said, that um, there's there's a very you have to be very careful with getting involved in a back and forth discussion um, on social media because it can very quickly become just a losing game and you've, you you're playing a game but you can't win. So I have a very love hate relationship with it, and I've kind of come to the point in my my artistic life now where if I'm going to say something about an issue, I'm going to do it through a, a project rather than just putting my opinion out there because I feel like there's a million opinions out there and I don't know if there's room or need for, for just a, a quickly written out opinion um, and shared. So I'm personally trying to now approach it as in, if I really care about something, then I will create a, an art project around that um, because then there's a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of um, thought and care has gone into that. So actually, I don't know if Instagram is always going to be my my future. Um, I think that there's some some really interesting things happening with YouTubers where they're starting to create their own uh, platforms, and I think that's really interesting. I mean, there's there's, a, there's always been that tension between YouTubers and YouTube of or ultimately they're working for themselves, but then they have this boss um, uh, of, of YouTube itself. And I think that there's, that's really interesting, but still you're not, never gonna get away from social media because no matter what you put out there, it'll start to live on its own anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the process now of, of trying to, to figure out, do I really wanna be on Instagram for, for, the, for the whole of my career? Do I, 
do I want social media to be the only way that I, I put things out? Um, it would be lovely and it'd be wonderful if there would be a way to exist separate to it. And then whatever happens on social media happens. Yeah. Um, Zing, can you, can you remember um, any organization, can you think of any organizations or people that have put out creative work um, and it's really stood out for you recently? Yeah, so um, I would love to give a shout out to this Instagram account called The God of Cookery. Um, and I'm sure, you know, many of you will have heard about the wave of anti-East Asian and Southeast Asian attacks in America and the US. And The God of Cookery is just a regular guy based in New York. And around the time of, you know, these attacks were happening, he created a cookbook called um, Chinese Protest Recipe. So he comes from a background where his parents are both takeaway owners in New York. And he kind of collected all these recipes from his parents and his family and kind of like themed them all in a way that, in a way that was kind of pointing out, you know, police brutality and how just because, you know, hate crimes are increasing against Asian people doesn't mean we should automatically support the police because, you know, the police, as we've seen with the Black Lives Matter, are not exactly, you know, a godsend either. Um, mm. So it was kind of this really kind of amazing project. It's put together beautifully because he has a background in graphic design. Um, all the donations went towards anti-police brutality organizations um, and organizations raising funds for Black people in America. And it was just a really beautiful kind of melding together of influences and cultures and communities and made me think of these issues in a way that I hadn't thought of before through the medium of food, which I love. So for me, that was probably one of the standout creative projects of last year where I really felt someone had used their creativity to talk about activist issues in a way that felt really new and really exciting. Mm, I love that. I, lo I also love through, through food. I think there's so many things you can do through an unexpected place. I mean, food's always a brilliant route, but you know, food, you can talk about the history of a country through food, you know, and, and the history of polit politics and social standing through food, truly. I love that, that sounds great, I'm gonna look at that. Andy, anything that stood out for you? Um, recently? Well, that's really interesting what you're saying about how you can use a different thing as um, a vehicle to talk about issues. And for me, it's um, Bob Mortimer and Paul Whitehouse go fishing. I love it. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so good. So that's so two good. things. There's two things that I love about that that program. Firstly, I'm really into fishing, and now all my mates want to go fishing with me, which they didn't before. Um, and secondly, they um, <laughs> the way that they the way that they talk openly about their feelings and about their health, about their mental health, about their past. Um, it really it's really unusual to hear men of that generation talking like that. And I think that um, it's setting a really, really nice example of where men need to get to with, with speaking openly about the, this kind of thing. Um, and because they're both kind of, well, I mean, they're both comedians, really, other things, but comedians have this amazing power to be really vulnerable. I think that going up on stage and talk and, and trying to make people laugh is the scariest thing you can possibly do. So comedians um, talking about that kind of thing there's a lot of power to that uh, because they, whilst they, of course, they'll get, it's going to be funny. At the same time, they they have got that ability to let their guard down and 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 really speak from the heart. Yeah, and I think it's also quite disarming when you see. I mean, I do, I agree with you. I just think it's such a gentle show, but 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 also so many important conversations are being had throughout it. But you do feel that with comedians, you, you, yeah, it's ugh, I don't know. Seeing, I think maybe for me, I, I'm agreeing with you seeing men of that generation be so open, it's actually quite disheartening mm. and actually bloody brilliant television. So I'm with you on that one. You're gonna come um, fishing? We thought it was a fishing I, show. <laughs> I need to watch it. I would so come fishing with you. <laughs> I love fishing, I love hiking, all that. I am like a 60 year old bloke really. So <laughs> that. Um, I wanted to talk about personal creative projects that haven't gone uh, to plan. I actually had a personal thing recently, um, uh, something that I'm doing that, again, I really believe in and I and was growing and growing. And then I put it on Instagram and it's one part of it didn't get the sort of engagement that I wanted. And I started to go for a week. I was like, the idea is terrible. It's dead in the water. And I had to sort of re-engage with my own bloody idea because of it, Instagram had sort of changed the way I felt about it. So there is that difficult push and pull that you have with social media. 
but have you had anything that you've put out? You were saying earlier about likes not being as much. Something that you've put out and then felt like you like it could ru almost ruin it for you, ruin a creative project when it doesn't have what you think it needs from social media response. Yeah, I so, mean, I yeah. so I wrote a full book series called Forgotten Women, and the publisher pushed uh, published all of them in the space of a single year, which I think now looking back, both me and my editor agree was a little bit too much for people. But basically, well, they'd um, put up they'd organize these book launches for the third and the fourth book really soon after the first and second book came out. And I think people, you know, obviously had gone to the first, people had gone to the first one, had, were already like, okay, I know what these books are about. I'm not gonna come to the third and fourth one. And the take up for those events was not great. And in the end, the bookshop ended up saying, look, we have only sold, a, we've only sold like some tickets. It's probably not worth your time to come down to like Waterstones on like, a Thursday night so shall we just cancel it and I got that call and I went home and I cried I was literally like these books are ruined for me um they are never gonna sell they are you know what was the point of putting all this work into these books and then everyone had to calm me down and be like look it's just like a launch it's literally just on a Thursday night where people just want to get pissed and go to a pub um, yeah. it's absolutely fine though it's not the end your books are going to be out there no matter what the books are not getting pulped because of it you know, it is just like an event that didn't go according to plan. So I kind of felt like at the time it was literally the end of the world. And I thought it was like a referendum on my kind of popularity and like legitimacy oh, as an author. But mm. now looking back, I'm like, you know what? I've done like dozens more events about those books since. And that was just a one off. And I feel like having that experience was really valuable because it kind of taught me that you just can't let one thing set the tone for an entire project you just always have to kind of brush it off your shoulder and keep going on wow thank you i will take that line of advice that was so true isn't it you don't have to let one thing now set the precedence for how you feel about a whole idea um but it can happen andy what about you have you i mean because failure i think is so important i when i was 26 i went bankrupt publicly and i thought it was the worst thing that ever happened to me turned out it completely rebuilt who i was as a human being. And I do think failure is deeply important. Andy, do you remember any significant failures, creative failures that have been really important? I mean, there's too many to mention, to be honest. I mean, it's just, um, I feel like I've got a whole catalog of, uh, of projects that I launched and just, did, just didn't go anywhere. Um, and I think that when, I, especially early on in my sort of, my artistic career, I did get a little bit, um, obsessed with the reaction it would get online with likes and, and, and comments and shares and stuff. But looking back, there's been plenty of projects that had an initial reaction way, way stronger than when I launched Notes to Strangers. And Notes to Strangers has been the one that, um, that grew and grew from there. So I think it's a case of, um, first of all, starting to not care about what the likes and the comments are and just pleasing yourself. So if I like it, then that's all that matters. If, if, I'm, if I'm creating something that I'm happy with, then it doesn't matter if it goes on to, to be popular or not. Um, and then from that power, from that, that position, you get a sense of power of, oh, well, if I'm just creating and I'm just living in that creative process of, the, for me, the best bit is always the making. So yeah. the reality, just the sort of what, what happens as a result of it. So I've just tried to live within the creative process itself and just focus on, this is the best bit. The best bit is making it. Um, and then whatever happens as a result doesn't really matter. Um, but I think also the, all the failures I've had, it's like you, you, your big step forward comes from the rubble of failed plans. Like you said about going bankrupt. I mean, I got fired from my job. I was broke at the time. It was all rubble. And then that becomes the platform, but you step off and, and you, you, you start something new. Um, so it's a real, it's a real, especially I think, I think people who are high achievers really struggle with it. And the people that, the, the, the people that did really, really well at school and always got A stars find, might find it difficult because in the real world, when you leave all that behind, you need to fail to be able to learn, Like you need to fail to be able to learn of how are you going to go forward next? Um, because the successes are great. And um, they they can be exciting and they've got all this this stuff that comes comes with them, but you don't really learn that much from them um, compared to the failures because the failures leave that sting, the failures leave the sting of the lessons, and 
the lessons that sting tend to last a bit longer. Yeah, I hate that sting. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's painful, but um, it's... Yes, it is. It's so deeply important. And um, uh, we, have a we have a question um, from someone watching. So I do want to get their question. This is Fleur Britton. She said, I wanted to ask the panelists about life in the doldrums. I think a lot of people are in the doldrums now with COVID redundancies. If you've ever been in the doldrums, how best to embrace them creatively and professionally? And I mean, I would just say quickly to Fleur, that is my hardest thing is not working. The moments in my life when I'm not creating or making was probably when I lost my mind the most. And I don't, I, I don't even know how, I, what answer I would give to get through those periods of time. Andy Zing, what would you say? Oh, uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, Andy, sorry. you go. Oh, okay. Um, so I'd say whenever, cause I get, I get asked that question quite a lot because I think from my followers, uh, I used to be very supportive with my work. And I always say it's about doing that tiny little bit towards a better place. So it's, it's, it can be, it can be when you're in the doldrums, it can be, it can feel like it's an impossible task to get from where you are to where you want to be. So I always say it's do that tiny, tiny little thing towards um, a better, um, a better place. So maybe it's just tidying your bedroom. Maybe it's just eating well for that day. Um, and then you just start to accumulate these tiny little steps that eventually you start building a bit of momentum. Um, but it's, it's just doing that one little thing that, um, that, that, that helps you start moving in the right direction. And then it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how far, how far you move every day or even every hour or even every week, as long as you, you keep moving that tiny little bit towards a better place, eventually you will get you will get out of it and you'll look back and go oh wow i was all the way there and now i'm here yeah it's interesting isn't it? yeah it's it's funny because you it's, it's also what you were saying about your work earlier it's like it's about re-immersing ourselves in process and not being so obsessed with outcome and and unfortunately things like social media make, make outcomes such a hugely important part of being creative but actually process is huge in, as you say, process of your day is huge, just getting up and moving a bit more each day. Seeing what have your experiences been like with that? I mean, it's it's really interesting. I think small wins definitely are really important. Like, so, like having a small win, even if it's just getting out of bed or like making yourself a nice cup of tea. Um, a friend of mine once told me that all work is accomplished while procrastinating from other work, which is actually very true because it's like when you're procrastinating on a big piece of work that's when you kind of start doing all the little things that you've been procrastinating on like sending that email again or like you know reaching out to that contact um when it comes to creative work I always love referring back to what all the authors I interviewed for the women's prize podcast um have told me so I did a podcast for the women's prize which is the biggest literary prize in the UK for women their shortlist actually just came out and it's amazing um and I interviewed so many authors who were nominated on the shortlist, like 25 years of them. And they had so many interesting insights on how to be creative when you're writing, which is probably one of the least like rewarding things when you're doing when it's really hard, it's impossible. And they had all kinds of advice, like one person uh, dictates her novel to herself while on walks. So she like goes around talking to herself like a mad person, <laughs> which I love. Um, one person uh, wrote everything on public transport so she would just get on a train and write on her phone because it felt like lower stakes than sitting down at a laptop or sitting down with a pen and paper um, another person would write it in text messages to herself again because it felt like lower stakes than sitting down at a laptop and she could like feel as if she was delivering herself a piece of work so I think there's all kinds of little kind of creative things you can do to kind of kickstart yourself um, just because the idea I think of sitting down at a laptop especially if you do digital work is really really hard sometimes you just want to like get up and start moving and I think a lot of people their best work comes when they're actually moving and taking a walk or like thinking while they're like on a jog or something like that so I think well, like yeah. one of the biggest things is actually just get moving like don't think that all work has to be done while you're sat at a laptop or at a desk mm, definitely sometimes I get my best ideas when I'm having a skip you know that's like, you, you, don't, you never know what sort of channels you need to open up for yourself. Um, we have another question um, from Hannah. Um, how do I pronounce that? Gown, maybe? Lockdowns have connected us to our local communities more. 
uh, do Andy and Zing have any tips on connection to others and growing voices with local issues? I love that question. I'm all, um, I, I love, you know what I love about, um, well, you know what I love about Corona? No, what I've loved about the last sort of 15 months is uh, how much I've seen my community come back into its space. I live in a very gentrified part of Hackney called Clapton and it has been taken over by other people that are new to the area. And just watching everyone sort of uh, come back out and share the spaces in a different way, especially in local parks, I've really noticed that. Um, have you guys seen anything change in your local communities in this in this time? Um, and what did you, oh, what she also wanted to ask? And growing voices with local issues. Yeah, have you just noticed anything in this realm over the last few years? Andy, let's start with you. You're um, you're Wolverhampton. You're up north. No, oh, that's the middle. At the moment, but I usually live in Brixton. Ah, Brixton, of course. Yeah, I think that um, I think that's since lockdown, there has there has hundred percent been a um, there's been there's been a lot more um, like looking to the local and and just the walks i think the walks has changed things i think the walk like because we've all been walking around like <laughs> i've discovered so much more about my local where i live because you're out of your mind bored so you just go on a walk and you just get lost and you find oh there's a nice shop oh there's a there's that's interesting that park oh i didn't know that was there so i think that there's there's hopefully that's a positive that can come out of um of this whole thing is that those local shops and businesses that you didn't know were around the corner and now you do. Um, because especially when you live in a city like London, you can, you can, there's, I mean, there's like 15 cities in, in London, it feels like, and you can never ever get to the, never ever scratch the surface of all of it. So I think that taking advantage of the, um, of how local we've started to become because of this, could be could be really interesting, and um, mm. when and, I, and I, I'd imagine that when you have a restriction on being able to be together, that as we come out of this, there'll be a lot of togetherness going on, and a lot of actually spending time in the company of of, of more of, of groups uh, of being together. Um, you'd imagine it'll be a complete opposite swing from where we've been of being all separate. So now all of a sudden we're going to be together. So it's a hopeful thought that um, that local communities start to, to spend more time in the company of each other and getting to know what's around the corner a little bit better. It's, um, it's, it's, it's that's some optimism. Yeah, that sounds so positive to me. <laughs> Thing, what about you? You're in East London like me. Yeah, I mean, I've been really heartened by the growth of mutual aid groups um, in my local area, especially around the time of the first lockdown, which me and my partner got involved in, you know, like delivering groceries to locals. And actually, I don't know if this is your experience, Nikita, but where I live in East London, there's still, you know, a whole community of old EastEnders who have amazing stories. So um, we still deliver food to um, someone we call East London Granny. Uh, Maureen, who uh, told us all about how Princess Diana visited the nearby hospital with Prince Harry. Um, yeah. is, she's great. Um, has given us like instructions on a guided walking tour of the architecture of East London. She's like 90, so she, she hasn't left the house in a while, but she's trying to live vicariously through us. Um, wow, I love that. And I think the mutual aid stuff is amazing. Um, volunteering at like local food banks, like people have so much time on their hands now if you're furloughed. Um, and I also think that, you know, there are all kinds of apps that facilitate uh, kind of community relations. Um, I'm a member of an app called Olio, where you just volunteer things to your community for free. So it started out as a food sharing app. So if you work, say, at a bakery or you're a baker and you've got like five cookies left over from like baking with your kids, you could just give it out. Or if you have food that um, you don't use anymore, you could give it out to members of the local community and anyone can just pick it up. I had really like great uh, interactions with locals through that, um, both yeah. giving and receiving stuff that people didn't want. Um, and I just think that technology, one of the good things, I know we've talked a lot about how social media isn't necessarily the best, but I do think that technology in general does actually facilitate quite a lot of random connections, especially in local communities where you might not necessarily interact with a lot of 
members just because you're not part of say the local nursery group or you know the local church in the same way that people used to be well yeah and I think it was quite ironically closed off even though they were things happening in your local community I don't think they were very open you didn't feel like they were for you or you could be you could go and attend these I'll be part of these things. I mean, I took some um, individual, I made some individual shepherd's pie for my granddad uh, and all his mates at his nursing home in Victoria Park. It's like the best Friday night I've had in a long time, you know, <laughs> a great time. But it wasn't about I'm giving back. It was more about living differently, you know, not just for a moment. Um, so that's been really exciting for me anyway. We have another question. This is from Ollie Crown. Um, morning, guys. Hello, Ollie. Do you have any advice, uh, any advice? Do you have any advice for the point just before you launch a project you've been working on for a while, how to get over the pre-launch nerves? Is there any way you recommend? Obviously Zing, you've talked about um, a launch night crushing you and making you feel and completely ruining your confidence for the evening. Um, but I'm sure you've also had a lot of successful launch nights. Have you got any advice for Ollie to just care a little less and be a little less nervous? Ooh, um... I'm a big, I'm a big fan of you know power posing from Thirty Rock. Oh, so Thirty yes. Rock is a comedy, right? Uh, with Tina Fey, and this is one bit where one of the characters says before before Tina Fey is really nervous before something, she just goes like, "You just have to power pose," and then she demonstrates what that is, which is basically like an in, incredibly deep slut drop, and then kind of shooting up into <laughs> Superman pose, and just doing a couple of those. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not joking. It actually does work. Um, I was really nervous before this big um, interview on stage with at South by Southwest, which is a big conference with Nicola Formacetti, who headed up. Oh Deep. my god! So that was massive. Yeah. That was the biggest thing I'd ever done. It was in a 200-person convention center, um, and and a colleague was like, "Just power pose," and explained the whole thing to me. And I went into a toilet store and did it like six times in a row. And actually. It sounds, it's, it sounds like it shouldn't, but it does. It really does work. So I recommend power posing. I love power posing. Andy, I hope you have one, because I actually have one. My cousin made me, whenever I'm nervous, stand like Wonder Woman, like stand like this, strong yeah, and proud. It really weirdly helps. And Andy, do you have power pose? I've done power posing, yeah, for sure. Wicked. Yeah, it's, um, it, does, it does work. It's, it's, I think you've got to find your own little tip that, that helps you handle the nerves. Um, for me, it's um, breaths out. It's long, long breaths out. So like at the start of a yoga class, they always do it where you, you sort of you, you empty your lungs and you do it three times. I, I find that really, really helps. And that helps with specific nerves if it's if I'm about to do something that's scary. But back to the question of like that, that sort of fear of when you're about to launch something, I know it so well um, and it never, ever goes away. And ultimately, you start to embrace it as part of the fun and it's part of the excitement because nerves and excitement are kind of two of the same thing. And it's healthy to be nervous. And if you're nervous, that means you care. So it's about embracing that, that, those nerves. And, um, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's never going to go away, sadly. It's, it's one of those things that, um, that is, is always a part of it. Um, and, and I wouldn't want it not to be a part of it. But what I do is... I like to think to myself, well, if this doesn't work, I'll just do something else. And then just let go, let go of, of any results um, of, oh, this might be fun. Something interesting might happen. It might not. Um, and the, the, I suppose the, the flip side of if something doesn't take off online, if something doesn't get likes and views and interactions, then your failure isn't that public anyway. So what have you got to lose? Oh, that's quite an interesting way to the guy. No one saw it anyway. Yeah, exactly. So just move on. Move on to the next. Okay. Um, so obviously we have been in a bloody global pandemic for quite a while now. Hope everyone's getting through it okay. Um, it's been a year of uncertainty and sort of just completely wreckage and havoc being made to our usual routines. And, and for me, um, it brought out creativity in lots of new and unusual ways and it's actually been quite good for my creativity, oddly. Do you think that it's hindered your creativity, what we're going through, or because the sort of oddness of it has maybe encouraged more crazy ideas? Zing, what about you? I'm going to start with you. Oh, I think it's definitely kind of given me a lot of perspective 
to be like, well, look, you know, all the things that you thought were important, actually in the face of a global pandemic are not actually very important at all. And it really made, made me at least, and I think for a lot of people I know, like reevaluate what was most important to them. And, you know, it could something be something as basic as they want, they need to be somewhere with outdoor space, you know, so then, so people are looking to move or they need to be near greenery. So people have moved out of London. Um, or, you know, they realized that family was actually really important to them and they'd taken it for granted because they always just assumed you would be able to see your family like whenever. But now the pandemic's kind of obviously like, put a stop to that. So I feel like in a way it's kind of made people realize what was most important in their lives and how they can kind of reorient their lifestyle around that. I think especially living in London, you kind of feel like there's a bazillion things to distract yourself with. And I feel mm. like what the pandemic's done has really distilled people down to what they feel is their most basic needs you know like once you know we're all in our houses and all flats you know hopefully like we all have access to like food light heat electricity sleep once you have all those bases covered what is it do you really need and is it is it like going on to a pub at, on Friday night and sinking like dozens of pints so you don't remember the next day or is it actually being able to you know speak to and hug your mum so I think it's mm. kind of really forced a lot of people into introducing this kind of perspective into their life, especially if you live in a really like busy, bustling city like London. Mm. And I think that's only going to do wonder, wondrous things for our creativity. Sort of yeah. this complete, utter change in perspective and and sort of what we what we miss and what we love. I know. I mean, I just I didn't realize my nan was my best mate. I didn't realize that at all until a global pandemic. Um, so this is coming right in the same week as International Women's Day, this conversation. Are there any great women that have particularly influenced or stood out for you? Andy, we know that you lost your mother. And it's not my phone, is it? No. We'll keep going. Andy, um, of course, yeah, you, you've talked publicly, uh, openly about losing your mother and what that was like for your life and you, and you know, in turn, what it was like for your creativity. Um, uh, would you like to, is that one of the women that have influenced you and stood out for you in your life? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think everyone, well, most people's mother would be their, uh, their sort of a hero, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, talking more, um, more sort of in someone in the public eye. Uh, actually, I read uh, Michelle Obama's book a couple of years ago. And I think that if you read that book, it's impossible not to fall in love with her a little bit because... I got it. <laughs> I mean, just getting to the book, arrived yesterday. It's <laughs> like, oh my God, I love this woman. She's amazing. Because um, I think politics and politicians, it, they can have kind of minds made out of metal and gears because the process of becoming a politician and po of politics is really dehumanizing. However, Michelle Obama is just so wonderfully human. And you read that book and you go through, you realize that she took on this insanely big job with all this pressure and she didn't particularly want it. Um, and she did it so well that she's become a superhero to millions. Um, mm. And I just think she's an amazing example of, uh, of someone that's kind of been in a position of power and, and come through the other side without like still a human, still a person. Um, yeah. There's something that she said about, uh, I think it was, it might've been at the end of the book or it might've been since she'd written the book about when obviously they had this eight years where they saw uh, progress and they saw things changing and things getting looking more hopeful. And then obviously Trump took office. And I remember her reaction was really so measured and um, calm. And she said, well, progress is not a like a smooth linear upward curve it's bumpy and sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards uh, and it's just all part of it and in that time when I think a lot of I mean half the half the America was panicking that kind of measured uh, calm approach um, logical um, and an and optimistic and hopeful approach was really useful and I found that sort of way of thinking of Remember that progress isn't this one smooth curve. It's not always going to be. Um, it's not always going to be success after success after success. Yeah, it's not just descending bridge up uh, to sort of glory. Of a cliff, and sometimes you go back five years 
or 10 years mm -hmm. but you've just as long as you as long as the intent to keep moving forward is there um mm -hmm. then that's all that matters uh so yeah I'd, I'd give her a shout out i don't know if she'll hear this but michelle i love you <laughs> well yeah i'm sure she is on this uh actually she might be <laughs> yeah zing what about you any women that creatively inspire you oh um right now i'm re i really love uh this uh Instagram are called Celestial Peach. She's called Jenny Lau. I've I've spoken to her before. Um, and she, and I don't know about whether this is just me in lockdown, but basically during lockdown, I started to really, really miss uh the food of my mum, uh, like Chinese food, basically. I feel like I've talked about food so much on this panel. Probably because hey, I know. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, Celestial, but Celestial Peach um is trying to educate people about East and Southeast Asian culture through food. And she does this in you know, really creative ways, artwork, interviews of people from all over the world, IG, um, live IG streams. Um, and I think that what she's doing is really valuable because, you know, and I think it's going back to, you know, what we talked about, sometimes the challenge is to feel as if you're putting something out there and you want like the biggest response possible for it to feel like a success. Like in the UK, the Asian community, at least like the East Asian community isn't particularly big. So, you know, Jenny, Celestial Peach doesn't have the same audience as like a massive, massive account, but everything that she puts out is just amazing and really well thought out and really grounded. And I feel like she's a real inspiration to me in terms of she stayed true to her identity and to her politics and to, her aims of trying to educate people and make people kind of feel like they're being represented on Instagram and in the media. So, you know, I give props to Jenny, she's great. So she sounds great. And that's what it is, isn't it? It's like, you got to, it's at the end of it, process, as you were talking about, we're always moving forward, but at the end, you've got to come back to yourself and what you're really about. And if, that, if, if social media is just a place to put parts of that up, then that is one thing, but it is all here in you on the ground, I think. And I think the minute you get a bit more in touch with that, and again, just enjoy the process. That's that's what I've learned from today. Process is so important because that is life. Not There's no end goal. We're just daily learning things and living and I'm bloody grateful to be alive, or, or me right now anyway. And uh, yeah, anyway, I just want to say that's what I'm really getting from you guys. And I love that because that's what I'm constantly trying to remember in my own life, creative, creatively or otherwise. Um, we are coming to the end, so I do want to talk to you guys about what's next. You know, the world's opening up again a little bit. Things are very weird and scary, but it's going to be one hell of a summer. <laughs> so what are you, what have you got planned, Andy? What's next for you that uh, you're working on? Let's start there first. Well, I mean, it's going to be difficult for but me. It's not talk. that time. No, no, it's going to be difficult for me to talk about it because it's currently top secret. So um, I'll have to talk about it in really vague terms. Okay. <laughs> but, um, I'm going to launch something that hopefully um, brings some joy and some fun and some um, good conversation uh, for those moments when we come back together. Um, it's going to be something that hopefully gets onto, maybe onto a pub table, maybe um, for the for when you get when you go around someone's house again. Uh, it's something to do. Um, is, is what I'm, I'm working on at the moment but um, it's trying to get the timing right because I want to launch it at the same time that we, we start to, to, to get back to, to um, some sort of normality but in the meantime I have actually been working very hard on um, some, some, other, some other things which I can show you which isn't top secret um, so with, me, with my dad we've been doing some childcare for my little nephews so I've been set to work building them swords <laughs> wow. wow wow that's yeah. incredible yeah so um it's, it's it's seen better days because um they've had quite a lot of fights and um they've yet to have a sword fight that hasn't ended in tears so um yeah why that's... don't why don't you carve them out of like bark i could do Can i mean they're, <laughs> they're made of cardboard at the moment and they're, they're, there's tears so i kind of don't want to go any more extreme <laughs> Uh, with, like, uh, with the materials yeah currently being a wonderful uncle then yeah uh be, being a, a um they're, they're getting all my creativity uh, for their swords yeah good who knows where the next idea will come from maybe, maybe it's there maybe. um zing what about you what are you going to be working on in this crazy new year of ours oh i mean 
right now I'm working on a book proposal, um, which is sort of loosely based on um, United Zingdom, the podcast I did for BBC Sound. So kind of about British identity and what it means to be Britain post COVID and post Brexit but also like more creatively than just sitting down on a laptop. I've also started doing clay. So wait, let me grab this. Bit. Clay? Yeah. I didn't know this was show and tell. I would have brought I my know, stuff. I know, it's show and tell oh. now. I love it. What do I have? I haven't made anything. That's my dog. Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh my God, I'm a real sucker for things like that, Zing. I, I love that. <laughs> lovely what's your doggy called do you not want to say on a webinar oh i'll show you her give me a sec sorry now this is just a full-on show and tell um, this is called Judy. i'll get my cat i'll get my cat but these are the the things that make us so oh hello gorgeous hello. is it uh do you is it a girl boy she's a girl she's a girl do you think she knows she's been immortalized in clay um she has absolutely no idea <laughs> what's going on i think most of the time <laughs> but that's why they've been so wonderful these beautiful pets of ours I think in this time it's like it's the only person in the world that doesn't know about corona it's like I'll definitely hang out with you, you the best to... ever for dogs they've had such a good year they've had yeah. a great year they really have they're gonna be really shocked. For a shock. <laughs> for a real yeah. shock like what happened to us before it's gonna to happen to them next they'll be like what's happening yeah. Yeah, why have we been suddenly left? Speaking of which, actually, we have one last question here from uh, Bron Bronwyn Latham, uh, who is talking about mental health uh, in lockdown. Lockdown for me has really helped me to focus on my projects and be pro proactive with reaching out to people. However, I'm nervous to come out of the lockdown as I'm aware people will suddenly get busy and not sat and not be sat at their laptops. Have you got any advice for being proactive after the lockdown yeah I, I kind of get what you mean Bronwyn because I've had this thing where my structure has changed so much like I'm so I've turned into some crazy workaholic but I'm but I can't do it with the world being normal I can only do it with the world shut down I feel that's my new thing I can only do this because the world shut down so what what are you feeling like how do you think you'll align the way you work with the world opening as it were Andy, let's start with you. Um, I think that with the whole of this, it's just all been so much uncertainty. Um, and I've lived in uncertainty. Like as an artist, that's quite an uncertain life. And I, so I'm, I'm used to it more than most. But even for me, this year has been so difficult. The uncertainty of it, just not knowing what, what's what's coming and not knowing how to handle it. But I guess all you can do really is is your best and do like as as... as whatever you need to, to, to get through it as best you can and, and, and handle things as they arrive rather than worrying about what's coming. So, because we don't know what's coming a lot of the time, we don't know um, what, what, what will happen. So you just have to, I think for me, it's been about shrinking, shrinking my, my, um, my presence down to the, the, the moment as much as possible um, because often the scary things are outside of the moment. Um, so if you live, try and live in that moment as much as possible, um, whatever it is, even if it's just a cup of tea in the garden or um, watching a, watching your favorite series that you're binging on, just try and live in that moment. And it, it gets less scary because often there's not, not too much bad in, in that, in that individual moment itself. Yeah. It's, it's mainly what we're scared of is the future and the past. Yeah. It's like me right here. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like a cat or dog would be. Um, seeing what about you? How do you see your life uh, panning out uh, after all this uncertainty? How do you see the rest of the year looking for you? I mean, I have literally no idea. And I think this is the thing, right? I feel like coronavirus has taught us all to kind of embrace uncertainty, but also not to underestimate our capacity to adjust to change. You know, like we're coming up to a year since we went into the first proper lockdown and I remember when, you know, Boris Johnson did his press conference and stuff and literally feeling like I was in the middle of a disaster movie. I was like, this is the bit, this is the montage bit before the apes take over and we all have to start scavenging for food and shooting each other in like Tesco. Um, and that didn't happen, thank God. Um, so I always think that, you know, our tendency as humans is to look toward the future and worry about the future. But, um, you know, my therapist always says to me like, are you worried about something that hasn't happened yet? 
yeah. which is absolutely true you know like are you worried about something that you're just projecting into the fantasy and in the same way you wouldn't worry about a daydream or you know a dream that you had there's not really much point in worrying about you know what five six ten months will bring from now because you know everything's just so up in the air but I, in a weird way, our lives have always been like that. And what we have thought, I think we believe that we are in control of them. And we're just not like it's just you have to surrender to the randomness of life. And I think that's what Corona's taught me is that like not about to stop making plans and stop having ideas, but just to stop trying to control the way those things play out and what that, that, that then will mean for this. It's like you're not meant to plan magic. Let magic happen, you know, otherwise it's not very bloody magical. True. I think we'll end on that. <laughs> no, guys, thank you so much. Oh, um, we do have one more. Katie's back. I just want to get this in before we go. Andy, did you feel restricted or defined by the Notes to Strangers brand or format that you created? I think that's important to get in. Uh, probably a bit of both. Yeah, I'd say um, it, um, it provided me with a lot of freedom to start with. Um, and uh, it's been a crazy, crazy ride for me. Um, but eventually that same narrow, narrow uh, format that I was producing work in started to restrict me. So I have um, started creating all of all different kinds of things. And the next project I'm doing isn't going to be Notes to Strangers as such. Um, and yeah, the whole thing is on hiatus. Don't know if it'll come back. Maybe it will. Maybe I'll feel like uh, I need to express myself in that way again. Um, but uh, I'm not thinking too far ahead. So just see, it. see what comes. I love that. I, they, you know, they well, before we did this talk, they said, you know, really talk about what you've learned at the end. And I always find that a bit forced, but I feel like I really have just learned to, to be a little, surrender a little to whatever the hell this is. And I think creativity definitely comes from that kind of surrender, you know? Yep. Guys, thank you so much. It was lovely to talk to you. On this sunny Thursday morning. Yeah. Andy Zing, thank you so much. Good luck with all your projects. And I'll see you out there in the real world when things get a little less crazy. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Thank you so Fingers much. Crossed. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you everyone for watching.